theft, stealing from the people. It has also created a perverse incentive structure where people join public service and not the private sector to get rich. Where people's riches or poverty are easily traceable to the duration in or out of office. This will have to end. As I declared a few days ago, I am looking forward to a government that shall embark on a direct cash transfer program to the two million poorest households in the country going forward. And I will repeat, I am looking forward to a government that shall embark on a direct cash transfer program to the two million poorest households in the country going forward. This program will reach about 8 million poor Kenyans a year, given that the average size of a household across the country is four individuals. This initiative will integrate the current social protection program on which we already spend 38 billion Kenya shillings. We would add about 100 billion shillings to this and expand it to include the poorest of the poor among Kenyans. And nobody should lie to Kenyans that taxes would have to rise for this to be realized. Far from it. This shall be done with resources redirected from a range of ministries that will initially take a 25% cut in their budgets. The budget cuts will be followed by an even wider rationalization aimed at transferring government services to the poor and towards assisting the private sector, SMEs in particular, to grow and to prosper. Cash transfers will be aimed at providing immediate relief to millions of Kenyans, but they will not be the ends into themselves. They will run hand in hand with investment in long-term measures to create jobs, reduce costs of living, and secure businesses, among other needs. We will be disclosing those measures in due course. But going forward, we intend to make social welfare <coughs> a critical and urgent policy agenda in the country with the aim of restructuring and strengthening those in place while coming up with the new ones. All this will be accompanied by an aggressive anti-corruption campaign that would not only save money, but also yield additional resources to be directed at protecting the poor. The figures may vary, but we are in agreement that the government is losing billions of shillings every year. We have been told Kenya is losing a third of its budget, the equivalent of about six billion US dollars, or Kenya shillings, 600 billion to corruption every year. We have also been told the country loses two billion shillings every day. I don't need to emphasize what this money can do. But I can emphasize that the, the losses can and will be stopped. The end game with all these processes shall be to create a government that cares, accounts, and caters 
in the word and deed for every single citizen, rich or poor, young or old, man or woman. We believe strongly that no single human being in our midst can or should be wasted or neglected if we are to create a great and prosperous nation. We believe Kenyans deserve a power structure and mindset that puts people first and politics last. We will make it happen by taking these first small steps. End of the statement. I think that was the statement. And um, maybe before you ask any questions, I have with me here uh, some of our experts here. One of them, Professor Wanyande, who will uh, make some remarks. And then we'll be followed by Mr. Ken Poget. Thank you very much. Um, what I want to add is this, that the statement that has been read contains a proper diagnosis of the challenges facing this country, which challenges must be addressed if we want to solve the problems of the majority of Kenyans. The diagnosis touches on at least three things. One is on governance, the management of our public affairs in this country. That has been a challenge for a very long time. But that challenge is attributed to a number of things, one of which is also contained in the statement, and that is the quality of our leadership. Unfortunately, in this country and indeed in this part of the world, we have a tendency to give very little attention to the quality of leadership, particularly political leadership, yet that is so key in terms of influencing the nature of governance. And the statement we have had today does indeed address the issue of quality of leadership. We want a leadership in this country that focuses on the people. We want a leadership in this country that is committed to the interests of our people. We want a leadership that governs with a conscience, a leadership that respects values as espoused in Article 10 of the Constitution of Kenya. That has been lacking. Instead, we have had in this country, ladies and gentlemen, what we might call today opportunistic leaders. Leaders who are able to manipulate the population, particularly the poor, and then turn around and say they want to help the poor. The very poor people that they are happy to manipulate. So we are saying that going forward, and this comes from that statement, going forward we want leaders who will govern with a conscience, who will respect the poor, who will respect each and every Kenyan, because every Kenyan matters. That is so important in this, in this country. And I wanted to say also, again arising from the statement, that the program, the policies that are being espoused in that statement are actually achievable. They are achievable because they are based on careful analysis of the figures that is provided to this country by the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. So that you work on the basis of facts not on the basis of opinion. It is so important, and therefore I'm saying that really that statement, in my view, is so fundamental that Kenyans should give it a very serious thought as we move forward. I will now call upon my friend uh, and colleague to say one or two things. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Wanyan. Uh, in uh, uh, summary, really, the statement that the Prime Minister read is simply a commitment 
that he's giving to the people of Kenya. It, it is a pledge. Uh, it's a vow that he's making uh, before the country uh, that uh, he will work towards dignifying and transforming the lives of the ordinary uh, Kenyans. And this commitment is based on a simple fact, which I can loosely call the present truth. It is true, uh, friends from the media, that there are many Kenyans who sleep without uh, food. There are many Kenyans who don't have a roof over their shoulders. There are many Kenyans who don't have access uh, to uh, functional health care. There are many uh, Kenyans who simply don't have access to a quality education. To achieve this, then, uh, he is making a very clear statement uh, in uh, uh, the, 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 the st uh, very clear commitment in the statement that he read that uh, he wants to come up with uh, people based, people focused, and people oriented uh, policies that will dignify and transform the lives of ordinary uh, Kenyans. Uh, how to do this in a very general way is that we have to change the way our politics has worked. Previously, we have had a situation and a structure that overemphasizes uh, politics. We have got a situation and a structure that really takes uh, uh, the people to government. The Prime Minister has indicated that he wants to change that and focus first and foremost on the people, on the ordinary Kenyans. He wants to put a structure in place that will create an economic environment that will enable him to directly serve uh, the people of Kenya. And then that economic structure will be supported by a functional governance uh, structure. So in summary, it is people first, people second, and people third. Thank you very much. I talked about five U's. Utu, Undugu, Umoja, Usawa, and Uzalishaji. Those are the five U's that we want. That is, summarizes the kind of society that we want to create going forward. Well, um, it is not really uh, creating a dependency syndrome. Uh, what we are talking about here is something that has been done in other parts of the world. It's called a social welfare society, where you care for the, the very poor who uh, cannot afford to be able to put food on the table. If you go to the UK, it is called the Dole. And those very poor people who don't have shelter and who don't have food are catered for on a weekly basis. They go and collect this kind of uh, money so that nobody is allowed to descend to inhuman conditions in terms of, of living. But it is not something that is permanent. As the society expands, as opportunities become more available, uh, as people get into employment, of course it is uh, basically written off. It's not something that people uh, uh, really depend on permanently. But it is doable, 
and we are going to have the biggest social protection program on the continent of Africa. This is what I'm talking about. Um, the East, of course, you see, there are certain issues that we must address seriously. The cost of production in our country, which is putting most of our businesses, uh, I mean, out of business. Um, because you find uh, you, uh, things like eggs uh, and, and milk uh, 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 and maize and so on are, are, are more expensive here than they are in Uganda. Why? It's because of s several factors. For example, in terms of, of products, the inputs, you know, the cost of plowing, the cost of seeds, the cost of uh, uh, fertilizers, the cost of chemicals are probably too high here in the, this country. And those are the issues that we really need to address, that Kenya can become competitive. And also the cost of energy. As you know, the cost of energy, very high cost of energy, is driving away several investors from this country. I know of a number of uh, plants, manufacturing plants, which have relocated from Kenya to Egypt, for example. Some of them even have gone to South Africa. Because in those markets, for example, the cost of power is four cents per unit. Well, here you are talking about 12, 13, 14, 15 uh, cents per unit. That is also carrying away potential investors who would otherwise come to invest in this country. So those are the factors which we are going to address very seriously so that Kenya can become competitive in the market. Uh, my name is Kennedy Green from NTV. You mentioned about 2 million families that are going to benefit from this. How are these families going to be chosen? Number two, you are one of the strongest defenders of the revolution this month. Even in the Building Bridges Initiative, you are speaking about how to strengthen the revolution. How does this play into strengthening the revolution when we are cutting money from ministries instead of taking to counties, we are going to benefit this. And is this program going to run in tandem with county government or a collaboration between the two? Well, you know, first, the figures are not taken out of blues. And this are as a result of proper analysis of our situation. The, the demographic uh, figures, experts have looked into this. And we know that about 2 million families are the most vulnerable. And that's why we are targeting them. You know, in some part of the country, take for example in Turkana or in uh, Mandera and those other places, you find the government is going for relief food during the drought periods. Uh, in, instead of taking relief food, if you give those people money, they'll be able to buy food themselves. So you do away with the relief food. And that amount of money will never go into this, this, this program. Uh, and uh, we, we, we have done very careful analysis on this, on this matter. And we think that this uh, will be the solution that is actually realizable. We are cutting certain amount of money for ministries, uh, uh, about 25%. Mm -hmm. But you see, the, what we have also done analysis, there's a lot of money which is remaining with ministries at the national level for functions which have themselves already been devolved. That, that, that money can go to this social protection program. But apart from that, there are uh, the, the, the money, uh, the services, which need to be performed by the devolved government, which are being held up here, and staff also being held up here. We want the national government to release those staff to go down to the county government, and the resources will follow them down there. We know that it is actually possible to devolve up to 35% um, uh, without much problems. We know that more revenue will be coming when you plug those loopholes and deal with corruption. As you know, we are talking about just 150 billion shillings for this program. 
but 600 billion shillings is being lost to corruption on an annual basis. So if you plug those loopholes, there will be more than sufficient money to deal with this, 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 this program. And we are determined, and you know, we did it before. When we came into government in 2003, we found when the government was under collecting revenue on a budget of 500 billion, they were only collecting about 200 billion, and they were depending on donors for 300 billion. We changed that, and within one year, we had jumped from 200 billion to 500. It went to 750 budget to 9. Uh, nine, 900 billion and eventually we reached a trillion and also the rate of growth changed from negative to plus two to plus five in the fourth year we had reached plus seven percent rate of growth and we actually had planned to go to double digits and I'm certain we would have reached double digits if the event of 207-208 had not interrupted this. So what we are saying is that we want to not to confine ourselves to single-digit growth. I am con co convinced that we can attain double-digit growth in this country. Uh, if we, we deal first with the biggest enemy we have, which is corruption. And I'm actually telling Kenyans that this corruption can be managed with the determination and we will manage it. Professor, my name is Emmanuel Cho from KTNX. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, concerns about the cousin Tani and the amount that was set aside to be transferred to the people who are working there. Are you going to make sure that uh, this is not going to be another way to... You see, p programs like Kazi Mutani, or Kazi Kovijana, or Kazi Bashambani are b not permanent programs. They're basically emergency measures which are aimed at putting money in the pockets of the youth when the, the economy is going bad the way it's been going bad, when the youth are so vulnerable. And they're palliative measures uh, which we introduce. But as the economy normalizes and opportunities arises, of course there will be no need for them. The, the, the youth will be employed uh, in much more meaningful uh, enterprises. We have come up with a very clear program. You saw it in the BBI, how we are going to empower the youth to be, uh, be self-supporting. Uh, that we're going to create a fund through which the youth can borrow money and don't pay any interest until after seven years when those enterprises have matured. Uh, but most importantly, we are going to begin with uh, skills development to ensure that these youth are imparted with proper skills uh, before they are given these monies. And then we're also going to ensure that uh, programs such as 30% uh, 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 of the contracts for the national government and the county government going to the youth. How is that going to be implemented? We said we are going to create a ministry of youth affairs, uh, which is run by the youth. And then there's also going to be uh, a, a commission. We want to make it a constitutional commission, that National Youth uh, Commission, which is itself going to ensure that the programs that have been uh, uh, prepared are actually implemented. That the 30% of the projects under the national government actually go to the enterprises owned by the youth. And the same thing with the, in the county government. And this, this, this will happen. And that way, we will ensure that uh, M, the micro, uh, small, and medium enterprises 
are given priorities that they deserve, because that is the beginning point uh, and, 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 and helps uh, to, to come up. Then we are also going to deal with these issues of uh, competition with, with, with imports. You find that a number of uh, enterprises owned by the youth are actually not having access to markets. The market is flooded with cheap, sometimes substandard products from outside the country. We need to find a way of uh, regulating this uh, so that our men in Kenya find a market. I started a business in the industrial area and the Lovana area used to be vibrant. Your company is there employing very many people. Today, you go to the industrial area, it's a distressing site. It's a cemetery of industries which used to manufacture. A number of them have relocated to either Zambia, to Egypt, to South Africa because of conditions I've talked about. But, so those enterprises are now basically warehouses. What used to be factories employing 200, 300, 500 people are now just warehouses for containers carrying goods from China and non-employing watchmen. So a company that used to employ 200, 300, 500 people is now only employing two people. So we have been busy exporting jobs to China. We must bring back those jobs here. And if we bring back those jobs here, we'll absorb a lot of this unemployment. Our youth who are roaming the streets, skilled, but have no jobs. This we are determined to do. And this is how we are going to raise up this country to the level that we want. That's Thank right. you. Let me first confine myself to this subject here. I launched what I call Azimio La Umoja, meaning basically a declaration of unity of our people. Because I believe very strongly that without unity, this country cannot be able to realize what I call the Kenyan dream. That the Kenyan dream, as coined by the founding fathers of our nation, which you find in our national anthem, God bless this land of ours. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Plenty. Plenty be found within our borders. That has uh, eluded us for the last 57 years of our independence. In other words, first, justice has not been our shield and defender because we have not had a proper democratic rule in our society. We have not dwelled in unity because we have divided society. Uh, in terms of uh, ethnicity, there are lots, a lot of fears and hatred among our people. Uh, then there's no peace in our country. Peace is not just absence of war. For example, a, a, a hungry person is not a peaceful person. A hungry person is an angry person. Uh, peace uh, and, and liberty. We will not have liberty. But importantly, plenty has not been found within our borders. We are still a struggling poor third world economy. Under the first Kibaki government and the Grand Coalition government, we came up with a vision 2030, which was aimed at transforming this country from a poor third world economy to a middle income economy 
by the year 2030. But we have not kept track. And it, it is most unlikely that we will not be able to achieve that uh, goal by the year 2030. We want to bring the country back to that track and fast track growth and, and development. We believe that it is realizable this is the right way. We have clear policies. Everything else has been already set up. We really need to implement, and I believe that we can get there. Thank you. Maybe Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You, you want to say anything? Thank you very much. Thank you.